I prepared a message uh, to share with you this week, and then as the week went on and I kept praying, um, different impulses began to come into my spirit, and, and last night, I just sat at my computer, yesterday afternoon, for that matter, sat at my computer, and I found myself just meditating. The impulse of my heart was, to, was a particular verse that just came into my spirit. And I end up just writing, sitting at my computer, and wrote six straight pages of material on this subject, which I have in my notes, but I'm not going to use that. I just trust God to be able to get the, the core of what I, I was writing last night, and what I believe the Holy Spirit was leading me to write. And it's about wholeness, about wholeness. This week, uh, on, on uh, Thursday, uh, a group of ministers in, in Brampton invited me for a day out with them uh, for a round of golf. And uh, so I joined them at 8 o'clock Thursday morning. As we were waiting, or, or in fact, during the course of uh, the, the round of golf, for me at this point in time, I, I have very little interest now in the actual game. I'm more about, you know, what is God doing in your churches? What is God doing, um, you know, in the church in general? And just trying to get a sense of what is happening around. And the discussion began as we stood on the tee box of one of the, one of the holes, uh, waiting a little bit. A discussion began concerning what is happening to the church. What is really happening to the church that's causing the depletion that people, young people, are no longer interested in church? The church, everywhere you go now, majority, just all the, all the saints are there. Um, it's like pulling teeth to get people to come to pray meetings or um, even to get back into your religious exercises of reading your Bible and stuff like that. And there seems to be like just a struggle uh, everywhere. Um, last night I met with uh, a, a, another person in, in our family, and uh, the question he asked me was, um, like, what is, what is happening to the church? What is happening to the church? Like, yeah, the church he's going to, like, seems to also be having a lot of challenges and struggles. And so, <clears throat> out from that discussion, as we stood on the tea box with these ministers, um, one, one person suggested, he said, I think uh, there is that sense of sufficiency that, you know, people in the third world countries, they tend to have a little more devotion, a little more consecration because things are harder. And so they need to trust God uh, for, for, for what they need. Um, and so uh, there is that commitment, whether it's forced or not, people are in that place where uh, they're more committed to God, to church and to all of this. Another person suggested that, another minister said that he thinks one of the problems that facing the church right now is weariness, weariness. And by weariness, you know, he meant that people are tired. They are tired. And uh, he began to elaborate a little bit in terms of what he meant uh, being tired. They're tired that they're praying and not getting answers to their prayer, prayers. They're tired because they've been trusting God to heal their bodies uh, for many, many years, and nothing is happening. They're getting tired, and um, they're praying for uh, their lost family members, and there's no shift. They're not seeing any changes. Uh, they're having financial difficulties. They're having difficulties with their relationships, children and parents and spouse, and it seems like nothing is breaking. Nothing is, is shifting despite... Um, they, them going to church and doing what they need to do. And so this is the kind of weariness, you know, to which he was making reference. And, you know, then as, as he, he picked up, this minister picked up his club and he was ready to just tee off, he kind of looked back at me and he says, but you know, Daniel talked about it, that the, that the, Horn, the little horn, will weary out the saints. And then I, of course, went back to my Bible to look at, and it was found in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25, 
the horn wearied the saints, wearying out the saints. Of course, that was a reference to the Antichrist. The little horn was a reference to the Antichrist, who after the church is taken out of the world in a rapture, they will follow in the world a period of seven years called the Great Tribulation. That's after the church is gone. Mm, uh, hell breaks loose on earth under the reign of this man called the Antichrist, or the whole little horn spoken about in Daniel and Revelation. And in this verse, the Bible says, he wearied the saints. So it's talking about a tribulation saints, the saints that are left, the people that are left after the church is gone, and those who are coming to faith will face severe persecution under the Antichrist. But John also tells us, the Apostle John says that even now, many antichrists have gone out into the world. In other words, he's saying before the actual man comes, the spirit of antichrist will be in the world. And it was there since in the days of John, as he wrote, he said, even now there are many antichrists in the world. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 says, before he returns, false Christs will arise. And so, the spirit of Antichrist, even though the Antichrist will come in the tribulation period and weary the saints and kill them, persecute many of them, even now that spirit exists. And so the wearying, there is some validation to the truth that there is much wearying that's taking place. And so with that in mind, I want, uh, as just background, I want to read, I want to read a couple of scriptures because I believe that God, help, God is helping us to understand the root of this problem. What is causing it? What is causing this disenchantment? What is causing this lack of desire for God, for church, for prayer? What is happening? What is causing this weariness of soul that it's an effort now to do something that once in our life was exciting, once was something that like David I was glad when they said unto me, let's go into the house of the Lord. When it was church time, I was excited. I was excited with to, to read my Bible. I was excited when, when it was time to pray, when it was time to get involved in doing things for God. Whereas now it's a struggle. It's, a, it's, it's you know, we're driven now by a sense of moral obligation or guilt. And that's not the way God wants it. So I'll, today, I just want to get back. I, I want to take you into... Uh, a place where I believe we can, we can get to the root of this problem. I do believe the weariness is coming from a misunderstanding, a misunderstanding of our own constitution and a misunderstanding of how God works and what God is after. And if we get a hold of that, I believe we are going to see a change taking place that will bring the excitement and the joy and the commitment and the, des oh, the desire back into our lives, the way God wants it. God does not want anybody to serve him out of weariness. God does, that's not the kind of service I don't want as a pastor of this church. I don't want anybody to be serving out of guilt or a sense of moral obligation. I want you to serve because you're joyful in doing that, because you want to, because you love what God is doing and you want to be a part of that. And God is greater than us. We are evil. And if we could have those kind of um, desires for the people working with us, do you think God, as our Father, will want us to, to serve him out of guilt or moral obligation? You know, no, I, I don't think so. I don't believe that for a moment. I believe he's a joyful God. When you look at heaven, if you get a glimpse of the throne of heaven, if I ask you to paint me a picture of heaven, you're probably going to paint a picture of a mystical looking person sitting on a throne with rainbow over it and thunder and lightning flashing and, and all kind of heavenly creatures flying about. That's probably the kind of picture you're going to see. You're, you're going to paint. Most people, if I, you ask them to give you a, give them a sense of God and the throne, it is always an awesome, semi-fearful picture of this God who's sitting and, you know, it's like awesome and fearful and, and, and these things. But here is how this define God, his throne, and what's happening around God. It says, at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. In the presence of God is the fullness of what? Joy. 
not an, an inkling of joy, the fullness of joy. It tells me that it's an atmosphere 24-7. There isn't time in heaven, but all the time, and it endures joy. The fullness in the presence of God is the fullness of joy, and it, at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Joy and pleasure. Is that not what we seek after? Is that not what the objective of everybody in this world is after? But it's to get a home, a nice job, a good person to marry, raise our children. It is ultimately so we could find joy and pleasure. And the Bible is telling us this is what the throne of God is. If we were to get that glimpse into the throne of God, this is the atmosphere that will envelop us. Joy and pleasure forevermore. Not a temporal thing, not a momentary thing, but it's the nature and the state of heaven and God's throne. God is a joyful person and he wants us to serve him out of joy. He wants us to have pleasure in doing what we do. So when we get to that place of weariness, when it's a struggle to serve God, when it's a struggle to, to, to commit to basic religious duties, it is telling me that we, something is happening, something is going wrong that we need to address. And hopefully the Holy Spirit will help us to clue in on some of that a little bit today. So kind of sit back uh, and, and let, let's move together with this as the Holy Spirit leads us. I wanted to just read this, um, this story. It is not a parable, it's an actual story of the ten lepers. And it came to pass as Jesus went to Jerusalem, he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. The lepers had to stay off the street. They couldn't mix with the people. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass, as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, were there not 10 of you who were cleansed? Where are the other nine? They are not found at return to give glory to God, save this stranger. One man out of the 10, all 10 were healed. One man came back to give glory to God, and he was a stranger. And Jesus said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you whole. I, I read line, I, I highlighted and read the word whole because I wanted you to, to notice something that's different between this one man and the other nine. They were all healed of leprosy. <clears throat> but only one man was made whole. The others were healed or cleansed. The physical body was well. When they looked at their hands and their feet, there was no leprosy. The marks and the traces of leprosy had gone. They were cleansed. But this one man who returned, Jesus said to him, you are whole. You are made whole. I've heard one preacher say that the others were healed in that the leprosy had gone, but the parts of their body that they had lost, people who are lepers, they tend to lose their joints and their fingers would fall off and different parts of their bodies. And so you could be healed, but not get your fingers back and the organs that you lost, get them back. And he was saying, the one who was made whole was not only healed from leprosy, but when he looked at his hands, all his fingers were back, all his joints were back, everything was back. Perhaps there is something to that. But I believe there is something deeper about this wholeness. And this is the next verse I want to talk about. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. Here is what the Apostle Paul is praying. 
And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Keep paying attention to that word, whole. That the God of peace sanctify you wholly. Now, what does that mean? When he says, may God sanctify you wholly. May God make you whole. He explains, and I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when he is talking about wholeness, he is speaking about the fact, he's pointing to the fact that you and I are not a one-dimensional being, but we are three-dimensional. And to be made whole means we must be healed in all three areas of our lives. These are three, we refer to them as, as the human being, as a tripart being of spirit, soul, and body. But these are not like three individual people. These are we, indivisible parts of us. Distinguishable, but indivisible. And he's saying that for you to be truly whole, you need to be sanctified, to be cleansed, to be healed, to be delivered in all three areas of your constituent being. Why? Because if we are, if these three parts of our being are indivisible, if one part is contaminated, the entire being will be contaminated. And I believe that this right here is at the root of why there is weariness. Why we are not healed. Why prayers sometimes don't get answered. Because we are addressing, for the most part, one aspect of our being. We are unawares, oblivious to the need we are, uh, the, uh, of healing in a holistic manner for our entire being. And so, take a simple example. Somebody comes to this altar and say, please pray for me that I might be healed of this arm, this pain in the arm. So we're talking about if the physical component of our being. They're asking for that part to be healed. There is no consciousness, there is no indication from that individual that there are two other parts existing in me that may have contributed to that problem. And what I need is not just healing for my physicality, but it may be my soul, the seat of my emotions and my mind and my intellect that needs some curing. Something has gone wrong with the way I'm thinking. Something's gone wrong with the way I'm processing. Something has gone wrong in my emotional, in, in the areas of my emotion. Something has gone wrong in my intellect, how I perceive things. That is contributing to that problem. A typical example is back pain. Someone may come and say, oh, pastor, I've got pain in my back. Could you pray for my back? Well, we know that most of the pains that you get, especially things like back pain, is not just the flesh, it's not just the physicality. Most of it come from stress. And stress is in the mind. So we are going into the, the area of our soul. The soul has a problem. How it's processing life to get to this place where it's stressed. And then it leaks into the body 
producing a pain in the back. So someone comes and says, pray for me, pastor, pray for my back. We're missing the mark. And that's just a little example that I'm trying to share with you to say that much of this weariness that comes about in our lives is because we are missing the mark. And James tells us, he says, we receive not because we pray not. We do not ask. That's why we do not receive. And he says, but we do not receive because we ask amiss. You pray and do not receive because you ask amiss. What does it mean to ask amiss? You're missing the mark. We pray and do not receive. I think it's James 4.4. 4. We pray and do not receive because we ask amiss. We are we are not missing, we are missing the mark in our prayers. We are addressing the wrong problem. Most of the times as creatures of physicality, we respond to sensations and believe that the effect is really the cause of my problem. Much of what we react to is the effect. Are the symptoms of deeper problems in our soul or in our spirit that leaks out into the body. Here's another, just off the top of my head, another example. Jesus said, if we do not forgive others, God will not forgive us. He did not put a qualification to the nature of our forgiveness. Forgive others except if they do something really bad to you. There is no qualification, no condition. Forgiveness has no condition. It's unconditional. And Jesus says, and we pray this, we pray this in our Lord's prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Yet, there a problem that inflicts the church. It's a disease it's like a pandemic in the church is unforgiveness. You know how many Christians harbor unforgiveness? How many Christians, how many people in the church do not talk to an aunt or an uncle or a grandmother or a sibling or somebody because of a hurt, because of something that was done? Unforgiveness, it's a pandemic in the church. It plagues the church. And we come week after week seeking God, calling upon God, whereas the scripture tells us if we do not forgive, God is not giving us anything. The doors are shut. And forgiveness lies where? In the soulish realm of my emotions and my intellect and my will. That's the realm of my soul. The soul is the seat of my intellect, my will, and emotions. That's the place where... I'm faced with these problems and I've got to make a decision. My will has got to say, you know what? Yes, I've been hurt, but God says forgive. He has forgiven me. I've hurt God. God has forgiven me. I keep hurting God every day. He keeps forgiving me. God is saying, if you forgive. If you don't, I'm not forgiving you. The door is shut. There is no communication between us. You can holler and cry as much as you want. I'm not hearing. David said that. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. He will not hear. It's not even a question of answering. He doesn't hear. It's one thing to hear somebody asking something and to decide whether I'll answer or not. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear. He just doesn't hear. The wall is built. Sin, unforgiveness are things that are resident, not in the body. But we harbor these things. These things are not dealt with in the soul. And we come for prayer. We can cry out year after year after year after year. Nothing's going to happen. We are asking amiss. We're missing the mark. We're not addressing the problem. These ten lepers... 
The way they saw their problem was I've got leprosy. My skin has changed color. My fingers have dropped off. I'm ostracized from society. I can't work. I can't have a family. All I want is my healing. If I'm healed of this leprosy, I can come back in society. I can mix with my family again. I can get a job. And I can carry on my life. The way they saw themselves is that they're one-dimensional. My problem is leprosy, a physical problem. They were cleansed. They were healed. But this one man who returned, he was made whole. Look at him. He came back. Ten men healed. One man came back. And look, when Jesus said he's made whole, remember we sing, we are spirit, soul, and body. And as Paul prayed, that God will sanctify your whole spirit, soul, and body. That is what wholeness is about. That's what God is after. Not a truncated healing of one part of my life. But it's wholeness. There is no point, as I said, in healing one aspect of my being because the rest will be contaminated. God is after holistic healing, deliverance. Salvation is about the salvation or the redemption of the whole man. Jesus did not go to the cross just to save my spirit. He went for me. And me comprises my spirit, my soul, and my body. This man returned to give glory to God. It tells me that he attributed his healing to God, that his spirit came alive, that he was born again, that he recognized the grace and the mercy of God and this could only happen when your spirit comes alive, when you're activated by the power of the Holy Spirit. So his spirit came alive. His soul came alive. The soul is the seat, as I said, of your emotions, your intellect, and your mind. His soul come alive. Look at this man. He began to shout. He became Pentecostal. He fell at the feet of Jesus. Watch the emotions being activated now. He was not concerned about what other people were thinking and what they would say and what they would call him. He began to shout. He fell on the dust, the dirty street, prostrate at the feet of Jesus and began to give thanks Began to worship. Worship, gratitude, thanksgiving. All these actions are processed or emanate, emanate from the soul. His soul was healed. And of course, his leprosy was gone. His physical being was made whole. And that's what God is after. That's why Jesus said to that to the nine, about the nine, that they are cleansed. Him, he is made whole. His spirit, his soul, his body, every part of him was healed. Now, it is not by accident. Let me go back to my my lead scripture. It is not by accident that the Holy Spirit who inspires all scripture gives us this order. May I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body. You and I, humans and many Christians, most Christians that I listen to always refer to themselves as body, soul, and spirit. We work from the outside in because we see our physicality, probably aware of my, I'm, I'm an emotional being. But as to what happens in my spirit, 
that I, I'm not sure, except when I was saved, the Holy Spirit came and did something there to regenerate it. And so that is the first day. My emotions are second, but my physical awareness that I'm a sensual being interacting with a phys in a physical world is always before me. And so we move from outside in generally on body, soul, and spirit. But this is how God moves. This is the structure and the order in which God moves. Spirit, soul, and body. And it's not just there because, it is not just there in that order because of a random choice. It is there for a reason. It is, prior, it is there structured in terms of priority. The spirit is the portion of me in which God lives. God does not live in my flesh. He does not live in my soul. He lives in my spirit. That is where God lives. God is spirit. And they that worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. That's why John said that. If we want to worship God, if we want to meet God, if we want to commune with God, if we want to have fellowship with him, we have to go and meet him where he is. Where is he? He is in my spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and he regenerates my spirit and lives in me. He lives in my spirit. This is where God lives. I know most of the time we, we think about where is God? And when we pray, we're always looking up to heaven. You know, God is up there somewhere. And we're always like, okay, you know, kind of this looking to heavens for God. No, you know where God is? <laughs> it's right in your spirit. Greater is he that is in me. God is in my spirit. The Holy Spirit is in my spirit. That's where God is. It's not a journey up there somewhere in the blue sky. That's now I have to access God. Accessing God is accessing my spirit, is moving through this flesh and all the distractions of the mind and penetrating into my spirit. That's where God lives. That's where I connect with him. Our tripart structure of spirit, soul, and body corresponds to the Old Testament tabernacle that had three parts, the outer court, the inner court, and the holiest of all. We are now the temple of God. There is no more temple. The Old Testament had a temple, but it was a type of the human body. So that temple, the outer court, corresponds to my body, my physicality. The holy place corresponds to my soul. And the holiest of all corresponds to my spirit. God never came in the outer court. He never came in the holy place. God came only in the holiest of all, the holiest place. That's the only place God came. Never ever did anyone find him in the holy place or in the outer court. He only comes in the holiest of all. That's where the high priest once a year would go on the day of atonement, and that's where he would meet with God. And that's where we will find God, not in my flesh, not in my soul but in my spirit. This is the reason why the entire New Testament would tell us to live in the spirit, walk in the spirit, sing in the spirit, dance in the spirit. Let our lives be lived. They that live, walk after the spirit, live after the spirit. Galatians chapter five. This is the message is to live there, abide there. Because that is where God is. That ought to be 
the seat of operation, the seat of the government of God in our lives. When God takes the throne of my heart, your heart, when you read about heart in the Bible, it's the same as your spirit, that inner component where God lives. When God takes control of your heart, you give him absolute control and you say, take the throne of my heart. He begins to rule and reign. When you say, and I sing that song that Kimberly led us in, reign in me. We're not saying reign in this flesh, reign in this emotion. Reign in my spirit. That's where he lives. But he doesn't always reign there. You and I have to give him permission to reign. But when he begins to reign, he will take absolute control over my emotions, over my body. It is an inside outflow. This is this my spirit is the seat of the operation of the government of my life. Every aspect of my life needs to be managed from my spirit. This is where God lives. Let me give you a good example of what this is what happened here. How this works. King David, Israel was always at war, always at war, always fighting. The Philistines won battle after the other. All nations are coming. Always, always conflict. The years that Saul ruled were years of conflict. Saul's entire reign was fighting Philistines and fighting all kinds of enemies. When David came, he put quickly to rest all the fightings. He defeated the Philistines. And here is what the Bible says. And it came to pass when the king sat in his house and the Lord had given, the Lord gave him rest round about from all his enemies. When the king sat on the throne. This is not, this is, the Bible is a spiritual book. Everything is written as a, an example for us. For spiritual growth, edification, comfort. David is a type of Christ. They were both shepherds. They were both born in Bethlehem. They were both anointed multiple times. They both fought against the enemy. David fought against Goliath, who was a mediator between the Philistines, for the Philistines. Jesus fought against Satan. They both defeated their enemies with their own weapons. David smote Goliath. He fell. And David took Goliath's own sword and destroyed him. Hebrews tells us that Jesus took death, the weapon of Satan, and destroyed him with it. And I can give you many other typical similarities, including... Their age of their ministry at 30 years, David became king at 30 years of age, Jesus inaugurated. David is a type or a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. And in this verse, it is telling us, God is trying to tell us, when the king comes and sits upon the throne, we are going to find rest wronged about. I like the term wronged about the entire ambience of my life, my soul, my spirit, my emotions, my intellect, my mind, every aspect of my life wronged about will experience peace. But Israel only experienced peace wronged about and from all our enemies, all our enemies, not just the Philistines, enemies, you can call them uh, economic challenges, financial problems. Saul had many kind of difficult problems beyond fighting against the Philistines. When David came, he had victory over all his enemies. And he had rest round about. Round about. Everything around him, including neighboring countries, began to experience peace because the fighting had ceased. And why? Because David was sitting on the throne. And so, here we go back to the subject of wholeness. Wholeness will only come about in our lives when Jesus, when Jesus sits upon the throne of my heart. 
where he's allowed to sit in his house. That is his house. My spirit belongs to God. It is his house. But for the most part, I'm the one sitting upon that throne. Or I share it. I say, Jesus, I'm in real big trouble. You sit on the throne and you figure this thing out. I got bad news from the doctor. Or I've got bad news. People are getting laid off of my job. I'm in a bad place. And we jump off the throne and say, Jesus, can you, can you sit there and fix this for me? That problem gets fixed and say, thank you, Jesus. But these are the affairs of my life. I'm in charge. And we bounce him. It's his house. The spirit is his house. And if we allow him to sit on the throne of our hearts, we will obtain rest round about. And from all our enemies, whether your enemy is a financial reverse, your enemy is poor health, your enemy is domestic crisis, whatever it is, rest round about from all his enemies. The entire ambience, periphery of your entire life will come to experience rest. This is a beautiful word. And I'll take another sermon for me to tell you what rest really is all about. But just to give you a sense, after six days of creation, the seventh day, God rested. And the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, there therefore remains a rest for the people of God. It's the dream. It's the ultimate. It's the aim of every Christian. It's what God wants us to find that place of rest. But it's a place of peace. If I can give you a little description of what rest is like, here it is. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. All right? In the book, Gospel of John. And he went on to talk about abiding in me. Abide in me. Now, what happens to a branch when it abides in the vine? That branch doesn't have to worry about sustenance. It doesn't have to worry about nutrition. It doesn't have to worry about anything. Just by abiding in the vine, the branch lives. There is no striving. It just abides in the, in the branch. The branch of, just avi, abides in that vine and it lives and it prospers. No effort. That's what rest is. That's the rest that remains to the people of God to find that place. And it's not very far away. It just takes the faith and the confidence for us to step off the throne of our lives and say, God, you know best. You know my needs. You know the, the issues of my heart. You are my creator. You are my God. I make you Lord. Step aside and say, my spirit, my life is your house, is your temple. My body is the temple of God. You sit and you reign. And when we do, we will find rest in our bodies, in our soul. Like this one returning leper, we will find wholeness. So we need, we need to understand the reason and the cause of all our striving and this weariness that these minister friends and I were talking about, this general weariness, this unanswered prayer, this not being healed, this not getting breakthrough, this all the things that weary us. It's because... We're approaching the problem from the wrong direction. We're trying an outside-in approach to fix this problem rather than an inside-out. Going back to the tabernacle, God came in the holiest of all, and that's where he spoke. That's where he gave orders. That's where he gave commands. Nothing the priest did in the holy place or that the priest did in the outer court, none of that was done unilaterally. They never used their imagination to say, how do I make the sacrifice? How do I, what kind of offering should this person give for this particular sin? They didn't have to make those determinations. 
The priests in the holy place did not have to use intuition. They did not have to use, be innovative in any way to say what needs to go on the table of shoe bread, what needs to go in the lampstand, how much oil, what kind of oil I need to put in the golden lampstand. They didn't have those things. Everything was given to them completely. The altar of incense, the priests did not have to think about how to make that incense. Everything was given to God by them by God. And it all came out from the holy place. Everything came out from the holy place to regulate the whole life, the operations of the holy place, which is our soul. The operations in the outer court, which is our body. And it impacted the entire country. Because everything flowed from, into the tribes and out into the land from the central place of the tent in the midst of the camp. All of your life, everything is going to come into place. It's going to come into order. It's going to come. Your health will return. Your joy will return. Your family, your lost ones who you're praying for will come to know the Lord. Everything will start. Everything gravitates to the spirit. And if you and I will cultivate the life in the spirit, We'll see the difference. We will see and experience the peace that are all around. So how do we do this? Quickly and we close. Be filled with the Spirit. The Spirit is God. And if we are filled with Him, then it means He's in control. Live and walk in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Study the Word. Study the Word. These two things go together. That's why forever you hear people, you will hear us saying, read your Bible and pray. Read your Bible and pray. Read your Bible, pray. Be filled with the Spirit, be filled with the Word. Because the Spirit can do nothing without the Word. The Bible says, Ephesians chapter 6, the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. So if you don't know the Bible, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's like a soldier going to war without a weapon. What is he going to do? He's going to die. No matter how effective and a soldier he is and how many years of training he has as a soldier. If he goes into battle without a weapon, he'll die. The word of God is the sword of the spirit. So it's one thing to be filled with the spirit. But if we don't know the word, where the spirit is not going to be effective. So we need to, and let me close with this. It is the spirit who gives life. I highlighted that because if you, if you forget everything else I say to you today, remember these few words. Life does not come from friends. It doesn't come from money. It doesn't, it's not sourced into anything that we think life comes from. Here is what, here is where life originates. This is where life comes. When Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, here is where that life comes from. It is not an, an optional source. It's the only source. The spirit who gives life. Why has Jesus come? I am come that you might have life. An abundant life. How are we going to get that life? Experience that abundance. It is the spirit who gives life. What we boil all of this down to is that if we are not prepared to spend time to be filled with the Spirit, to empower our spirit, that means putting God in control of my spirit, and of the central administration district of my life, we are going to experience problems after problems after problems. To fix your physicality or emotional problem from an outside in as opposed to fixing it in the spirit is just a band-aid solution. It's just topical solution. But it takes effort. It takes effort to be filled with the spirit. It takes discipline to be filled with the spirit. It takes daily waiting before God and say, God, fill me up. Think about your car. 
how often you have to drive into a gas station to fill up your car. And you will say, no, I, you know, this week I'm not going to fill up. You're going to be left on the highway or left somewhere that's going to cost you money. But you go in systematically into that gas station and you're constantly watching the needle on that, on that gas gauge to make sure that you are safe and that you are always having enough gas to go. But our spiritual lives, do we pay that kind of attention to it? To see where my needle is in my spiritual life. Am I running on empty? Am I running on fumes? It's easy to stay full if you pray every day. Some people wait for their, for their gas tank to go almost until that yellow thing comes on and start beeping. That little gas tank, little logo, and then try to pull in. But you know whether it's psychological or not, when you pull in after that little warning sign comes up, you probably will spend 60 to 80 bucks, 90 bucks, depends what kind of gas you use, to fill up. But if, say, for example, every time your car goes to, say, a quarter uh, or three quarters of the tank, a quarter is used up, you pull in, you may just spend 15 bucks. And you're full, you're full every time. If, say, you were to go in, I'm not saying you do that, but I'm give, trying to give you an analogy. If every other day you go in and just put in $15, you're constantly, it's easier on your pocket in a way, right? In a spiritual sense, rather than waiting for us to go on fumes by not praying or reading for weeks, and then we are running on empty and it's a struggle when we get into church. We can't pray, we can't sing because we, are, we can't worship because we're so dry. Rust is beginning to form. And when rust begins to form, not even Kimberly can help you. But if we pray every day, keep topping up, we're always going to be full. Once we're full, God will reign. When God is reigned, we'll have rest round about and peace from all our enemies. Amen? So be made whole. Not, don't be satisfied with being healed. Like the ten men. And here's the problem with the, ten, with the nine. The nine of them, they never returned. They never returned. They never acknowledged God. That, like this man who came back to say thank you. And to acknowledge that it was the grace and the mercy of God that made him well. And that implies that he's going to be thankful. He's going to serve God, go to the temple, whatever. These other nine never came back. And do you know, if I were to, if I were to chance a prediction on what happened to the nine of them? That because they didn't have God in their hearts. Where it's that leprosy that will return, something else will happen to them. Some other malady will strike them. This man, though, he was in a place of wholeness. And that's what God wants in us. And I say this to you with all of my heart, with all sincerity and deep belief, that if we allow God to sit in his house, upon his throne, take control, just as David brought peace and prosperity. Israel had never known before or after that level of prosperity the nation found under the reign of David. When David sat on the throne, Israel became most prosperous. Nations, people, kings from other nations brought materials to help them build their temple. All or everywhere, people began to come. They began to come. Bless Israel. Bless Israel. Bless because David sat on the throne. You want to see a change in your life. You want to see healing in your body. You want to see remote, your emotions uh, stabilized and, and come into balance and be healed and whole. You want to see everything in your life change. Turn around. Give God control. Let him.